Supreme. Oh, uh, well, it was peace or war. That's the two products. Peace. Peace. Do everything but peace. You can't tell me when each one of us can, get, can die of cancer that there's not one dollar that each of us can give. Well, okay, what, what, what's most important to you? Wife and kids, family. Oh, that was a hard question. And so the week, I guess. That in a place of the week. Uh, Jesus and God. And definitely my kids, my true boys. That probably gave us the encouragement to continue on on that path, that we weren't alone. We were all feeling it. If there was ever a time for the gospel that can transform the human heart, it's now. I have a dream today. Can I get an amen? Amen. The apostle that received the most powerful compliment from the Lord Jesus Christ after the rooster had crowed three times, sat curled up in a corner in shame and regret, for he failed to stand for the Father. He failed to stand up for the Son, Lord Jesus. Hours before, he took a sword and cut off the ear of a soldier that was trying to arrest Jesus and take him to his death. But here now, a couple hours later, he failed to stand and he failed to say, this is my Lord and this is my God. I don't know about you, but we've probably all at one time or another uh, had a time in our life that we failed to stand up for the Lord and his purposes. Maybe we failed to stand up for a family member that really needed us or a child that needed us in a certain time. Maybe there was a time that a colleague needed us to have their back at church when they stood up for some, or at work when they stood up for something that was important to the organization and they needed your covering and you just cowered in shame and an inability to stand. I'm a little ashamed, but I'm going to tell you a story of something that happened to me recently. I've told it to some of our team already, and it's worth saying it again because it's so affected my heart. Recently, Kathy and I had an opportunity to uh, go down to Edmonton, and somebody was picking, up us and, uh, picking us up and giving us a ride there. And um, so we'd made arrangements about a week out for this to happen, and they were supposed to come at a certain time. Well, the day before they called and they uh, said, we're going to come a half an hour earlier. So we're going through our morning routine. You know how important going through your morning routine is. And it's comfortable. You've got your coffee, you're sitting, doing your devotion, doing whatever. Well, all of a sudden, this guy didn't just come the half an hour early like he said he would. He came a half an hour earlier than that. He knocks on the door. Kathy's running around getting herself ready. <laughs> I'm sitting at the dining room table trying to hear from God. And this knock comes at the door, and this man walks in. And I'm a little frustrated, a little like, man, what are you doing? And so I begrudgingly kind of said, hi, would you like a water? Would you like a coffee? No, I've got all that. I did those things that I needed to do and then continued in doing what I needed to do. So finally we went, we got ready, we got in the vehicle, we started to drive to Edmonton. Well, I had things to do. I had a plan. I was texting, I was sending emails, I was doing the things that I need to do that day. And of course, like everybody in their trip to Edmonton, you had to get a little bit of a cat nap in there too. And this man kept, you know, just bringing up God or he knew that I was a pastor and, and he kept bringing up God and seeming to want a dialogue for that. But I didn't engage him too much. And when we got to where we were going, we got out of the car, we thanked him for his service and being so kind to us. And um, my dear wife, my dear wife, I'm so thankful, kind of leaned over to me and said, you really didn't give that man much attention, did you? That man wanted to know something about the Lord, was wanting to enter into a conversation about the Lord, and you didn't seem to have time for him. And I went, you're right. I think my entire life, for at least the last 34 years, I've had a personal mission statement to reach, build, and activate to impact people to impact the world for Jesus Christ. That's my personal mission statement. That's what I believe I stand for. number of times... Uh, I've preached the scripture, John 4, many, many times that look up. Jesus was talking to the disciples as they missed the Samaritan woman. 
He said, look up, the fields are white unto harvest. I've preached that over and over and over to people that are around me that, you know, look up every day. God is bringing somebody into your pathway that is ready to hear the gospel. And here this day, God sent a man into my living room, sitting at my dining room table, and I didn't get it. And I failed because of my intention on my own purposes and my own will and my own comfort and my own plan, and I missed that man that God brought to my path. There's many of us that are probably uh, can identify with that story in one regard or another. We're going into our series. Uh, again, we're just the forward message in our series, What Do You Stand For? And Pastor Eric, the last couple of weeks, we've talked about, you know, making a stand for Christ. He's our purpose. He's what we stand for. And in this series, we're laying out how we stand and why we stand and in what methods do we stand uh, for God. But I'm very aware that there's a powerful force that is all, uh, coming against God's people and anyone when they're trying to stand for truth or when they're trying to stand for righteousness. There's a powerful force that causes even the most strong Christians to bow their knee and throw their convictions kind of into the sea of, of compromise. There's this force that comes at us that regardless how uh, you know, determined we are, to bring this message forward or to stand for God, somehow this force often sneaks up on us, distracts us, and overtakes us and causes us to fail. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. When we look at this message, uh, we're going to look at reasons why we don't always stand when we want to. This message, I don't know if you're going to like the message. But I know you'll like the message. I don't think you'll like the title, Dog Gone Faith. You'll understand in a little while why I'm telling it, giving it that title. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word today. We're grateful for the faithfulness of your people joining us here in worship and celebrating your goodness. I thank you for the presence of people that are coming for the first time here today, for those that are coming even though they're discouraged. Father, I thank you, and I thank you for your promise that when we gather together in your name, Jesus, that you're here in our midst. We invite your Holy Spirit to touch each heart and touch each life, to bless the speaking of your words so we can all have new hope, new faith, and new courage to stand for what you've called us to stand for. Father, we dedicate this time to you right now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, we're picking up a scripture text today is 1 Peter 5, and we're going from uh, verse 8 and 9. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. This is God's word. He's challenging us to stand firm. That word stand firm has a lot of connotation to it. It means not a one-time stand, but be consistent and be faithful in your standing up and be diligent and alert that the enemy, whether you might be faithful in these areas and standing so successful so many times, that if you're not alert and if you're not aware, he can attack you from another side or another method, and you too will be caused to fall or fail. I remember the story of uh, my daughter Elizabeth and I, and Kathy and I, we lived, uh, we rented a, a property one time, and um, uh, there was a dog that lived next door and some neighbors that lived next door. And uh, the children always play in the backyard like children do, and there had never been a problem with this dog. But one day, uh, I was with the, the school was about to start. It was about this time of year, and I was in a prayer meeting at the church, and, and uh, Kathy was at home with the kids. And, and the Lord had told Kathy to go to the backyard, and she went to the backyard, and she saw this dog attacking Elizabeth. Our, I think she was about seven or eight years old, attack, attacking her. The dog ripped her ear open, not just the outer thing, but the, the cartilage well, locked the teeth into her shoulder, and there was blood everywhere, and it was a horrible sight as this dog was shaking our daughter. Well, by the grace of God, Kathy, God had told Kathy to go out there. She goes, the dog was pushed away, and we took Elizabeth to the doctors, and there was um, several stitches outside, inside, back, and whatever, And so this was quite a traumatic experience for Elizabeth and for Kathy to watch it and the other children watching that. 
And so the next day, you know, we took her, she got the stitches all bandaged up. The next day, Elizabeth and I were out for a date or something. And we decided we were going to go to a garage sale. How many people like to go to garage sales on occasion? Well, they even had garage sales 25 years ago, just for those of you that are younger in the crowd. Well, we decided we were going to go out. We had a little snack. And of course, we went to this one house. And as we walked around the corner in this house, all of a sudden, we see all these dogs coming at us. And there was like five or six or seven. I'm not exaggerating. It was so odd that all the neighborhood dogs were at the garage sale. I don't know if they were buying or selling, (laughs) but they were there. And I said, hey. And of course, all these dogs come running up to the new people that they haven't sniffed yet. So we go up and see the dogs running and, and it didn't, they weren't a growling, it weren't too aggressive, but, but they were running at you. And you can imagine if you'd just been bit by a dog, torn your ear by a dog and all these things running at your face, you would be very terrified. We just stopped. Elizabeth grabbed my hand and we just stopped and we just stood. We said, just wait, just wait. And I'm going to tell you the rest of the story later. <laughs> these dogs... We're very similar to this force I'm talking about that often interrupts us from doing what God wants us to do. These dogs were between us and the treasures that we'd been there to get. And these dogs continued to sniff and approach us in different ways. The the force I'm talking about that holds us back from standing the way God wants us to stand or how he wants us to stand is the force of fear. We see it in the world. We see it in every way. And we need to look at God's word and how, it's, how it shows us how the devil attacks us with various types of fears and how we can use God's word to combat those fears so we can do, we can stand for what God wants us to stand for and we can stand how God wants us to stand, okay? Fear attacks our convictions to stand for Christ. We're going to start the fears that I'm going to mention today are some we all know very well, the fear of being centered out. The fear of missing out, the fear of being wiped out, the fear of being called out, and the fear of being all out. Well, the fear of being centered out is a common fear. We all have it. It's it's a healthy fear that causes us not to do too many stupid things most often, but it's the fear of failure and the fear of embarrassment. We often live our life anchored in the pride of our own life. We are just walking in our life trying to make sure that we aren't embarrassed, that we don't stand out. This is why we don't like to do public speaking, because why don't do public speaking? I'm going to look stupid. Can you get a witness? Nobody wants to look stupid. So there's, there's this fear of being centered out for something you've done wrong or something in your present time or your past time. So we walk around kind of turtling and living this life kind of like shy, because if they ever knew what I did back then, I would be in trouble. This is also called the fear of man. And it is something that the Bible warns us sternly about, that we are so frightened about what people are going to say or what people are going to think of our past that we cannot live and walk in the direction that God told us to live and walk in now. I mean, we even dress in the morning. Uh, lots of researchers and markers say we, we dress for the invisible audience. You know, we think that, oh, this is cool. This is the new cool. It's true. Marketers play on this and spend millions and millions and millions of dollars based on um, your, your desire to fit in. And so um, it's important that we recognize that this is rooted in pride and the result is a lack of confidence and boldness to stand. Maybe we're always apologizing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We walk around on not just Canadian <laughs> that we're always apologizing, but we're walking around always worried about interrupting in people. And it's the fear of man that often causes us to lack confidence and stand as a child of God, as the prince of King Jesus. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. We need to put our trust wholeheartedly in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know who he says we are, stand on that, believe that, declare that, and walk in it. And we will not be succumbed to the fear of man that is often a force that demolishes God's plan for your life. The fear of man is the beginning of evil. You know, it's, you do not want to have a fear of man. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. 
by knowing our identity as a child of God, by knowing that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, to know in Psalm 8 that he has made us just a little bit lower than the angels, to know the dignity and integrity of who we are as Christians will cause us to rise above the fear of man and walk confidently into what God has called us to walk into. The next fear, fear of missing out. Oh, FOMO. Somebody mentioned that earlier, fear of missing out. You know, often we, in our desire to keep ourselves looking good and keep ourselves um, secure in this world that's pretty uncertain at times, we are always trying to control our own lives. And when we're trying to control our own lives, we try to control it with our, our resources. We try to control it with our time. And sometimes we, we look at, oh, well, there's an opportunity, and that's going to help me get what I need to do to be more secure. And so this fear of missing out on the next big thing drives us to do things that we don't want to do and never would have done. Like if my mother would have ever saw me do that, she would have rolled over in her grave, you know. But it's all of a sudden you get this impulse because there's this fear of missing out. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go there. I'm going to buy that. And all of a sudden we look backwards and we go like, what did I do? It's a fear of missing out that's driving our decisions and driving our intentions and the thing that's pulling us off often the stand that God wants us to make in a certain area. It can be seen in a fear of the unknown. I'm so worried about tomorrow. I'm just going to do this. Or fear of loss, fear of your job security. It brings tremendous anxiety in our lives, and it steals our freedom. The fear of missing out steals our freedom because we're not driven by the Spirit of God, which brings peace and life. We're driven by what we need to do to be constant. And that's what the devil loves to do. He likes to trap us up, make us anxious, make us busy, and there's no peace anywhere to be found. This is a fear of missing out, and we can come against it when we look at what the scriptures say. The result of uh, yielding to this fear of missing out is you overextend yourself physically, financially. There's anxiety and there's exhaustion because you're always comparing yourself with the next guy. And it will kill us. It's killing our culture running, striving, longing for more, never satisfied, always reaching, always grabbing. It's stealing our life. God says, relax. Matthew 6, 25 and 3rd to 34, we know it well, but it's worth reading. Jesus said, I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more vulnerable, valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that they are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today has enough trouble for today. Fear of missing out causes you to depend on yourself. God is saying, trust in me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, every way, financial, relational, work, put your trust in him and he will direct your life. He will direct your path and it will be rewarding. It will be fulfilling. It will have a future and a hope and peace. Philippians 4, 6 to 7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. We're in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we're already having some amazing testimonies come in. As people testify, or as people you know, put their prayer requests in, you can go online and leave a prayer request on our website. Uh, you can look at the, the feed of the email you got Friday, and there's a link there to put in a, a prayer request. But already we're seeing uh, prayers answered. I was praying with a man the other day, a group of men, and he was very frightened because um, his wife has problems with addictions, serious addictions. And uh, he went to the meeting, and we prayed for her freedom because uh, 
He knew there was a certain time of the month when certain people came to town, uh, certain drug dealers came to town, that they would, many people that were addicted to drugs would go and they would lose them for two or three days. This man texted back later that night after we prayed about his wife's freedom, came back and said, we don't understand. My wife is in the house. She's here. She said, I got myself into this trouble. I'm going to get myself out. Prayers are being answered of serious, serious things. And we can trust God that if we cast our cares upon him, he will care for us. If we trust the Lord with our things, we don't have to worry about missing out. Amen? Join us for prayer. Pastor Eric's going to tell us more about that later. We'd love to have you join in. and where, if, Even if you're at home, just off, take some a little time to be with the Lord in prayer. The next fear, fear of being called out. Um, Peter, as we said, it just this great exploits. He had received the greatest compliment that anyone had ever received from the Lord Jesus. Um, and there he is. He's doing something, and he gets called out by these people that are around the fire. And, you know, often we are reluctant to stand up or identify ourselves as a Christian because we're going to get called out. And I don't know about you, but uh, anytime I've stood up as being a Christian, somebody will either point out a mistake I've made in my past or a problem in my life currently, or they'll point out one of the worst things they've ever seen in any Christians in the world and say, yo, you're a Christian, eh? Well, look at what that guy did, and look at what that girl did, and look at what this did. So I realize there is a real fear of standing out. You don't want to stand out and make yourself think, oh, I'm better than you, I'm better than... But God is calling his people to stand for him, to not arrogantly and condescend on people and tell everybody what they're doing wrong, but to stand up. We do have accountability partners. We do have to serve one another and speak the truth and love to one another. But God is calling us not to be afraid to stand up for him or a fear of being called out by him or by people around us. Philippians 1, two, it says, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Matthew 10, 32 says, Anyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before the Father. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. God is calling us to make a firm stand as being his children. And I know it's hard as a business when you stand. I know that there's a movement in our culture of of, uh, you know, calling people out and canceling people out, saying that organization did this or that organization believes in that. Do not support the restaurant anymore. This is a real thing. It's a tactic of the devil. But regardless of what force is coming against you and what you stand to lose, God says, you stand for me and I will fight your battle. Psalm 60 says, through our Lord, we shall do valiantly for it is he, it is he, say it is he. It is he who will tread down our enemy. And we need to get this in our heart. This is what standing firm is. You lock these promises in your heart. You declare these promises when, you know, all else is failing. You stand, you declare, regardless of what the cost is going to be. You stand and watch and see the salvation of your God. Watch what he will do. Watch how he'll come and support you in this way or that way. He loves you. He's going to give us that fortitude and that strength to stand in him. Amen. The next thing is the fear of being Wiped out. The fear of death. Well, this is a pretty good fear to have. It's the thing we learn so we don't run it in front of a car. It's the thing we learn. But a fear of death can overwhelm us and overtake us. And we see the devil using many tactics right now in using this fear of death. You know, we we hear all these reports, the fear of terrorism now in North America. You never know when somebody's going to attack her. There's the fear of the potentially mass shootings. Like this fear is rising up, and the tactic of the devil is to continue to speak these things out, speak these things out, and it plays on your natural fear of death, which is a healthy fear to preserve yourself. That's a healthy fear. But when it goes over into this line, the devil uses it in a different way. It's going to cause you to react. It's going to cause you to slow down. It's going to cause you to shrink back and not walk in your victory, not walk in your freedom, not walk and stand what God wanted you to stand in. So we have to be very, very careful that we discern these things, we pray against them, and we continue to stand up and not let them affect us. Uh, I remember 
to illustrate this point, I remember my COVID experience and everybody has their own story and their own convictions and I'm not here to place a judgment on any of those. Uh, but what I am here to say is my experience was with COVID was like everybody else's. Hey, COVID's coming, you know, the sickness and, and science says you're going to get sick and die. And fear entered our heart. Yes, we should get this. Well, then we didn't like the way the government responded to it, enforcing it and doing all those things. And so, um, you know, we took a stand and I said, yeah, I don't really want to take that thing unless I absolutely have to. And then it's like, but, but not taking that thing is going to hinder me from what God is calling me to do. If I don't take that COVID shot, I can't go to Cano College and talk to people about the Lord. I can't go to Fort Chippewan and talk to people about the Lord. So I said, I'm going to just take that shot. It's like the fear of the shot stopped me for a while. Then, uh, or the fear of COVID stopped me for a while. Then the fear of the, sh- the shot stopped me for a while. But I finally said, it's my freedom that's being limited here. God has given us freedom. So whether I take the shot or don't take the shot, the Lord is my God. He will preserve me. He will keep me until the day. So I took that shot. Now, I will admit, when I went there, I said, let me see what's in that bottle. She gave me the bottle. I took a picture of it, sent it to Kathy just to make sure if I died, she'd know what I took. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, she'd know how to sue, you know. So uh, me and the girl give me the shot. Can we take the selfie? I'm going to send it to my wife. Anyways, um, freedom is the issue here, the fear of death. Whether you took it or didn't take it. I had people saying to me, oh, you sold out, you sold out, you took the shot. I said, I didn't sell out to nothing. I'm sold out to Jesus. And whether I take the shot or don't take the shot, me and Jesus are marching to wherever he's telling me to march. And that's the confidence we need to have in the Lord. That regardless of the voices, don't take it, it'll kill you. Regardless of the voices of you, if you don't take it, you will die of COVID. Live your life in freedom and peace. That's what the Lord Jesus has died to give us, that we walk in that confidence, we walk in that peace, and no weapon formed against us will prosper. We might get the odd dent, we might get the odd bruise, we might get the odd ripped ear from a dog, but no weapon is going to hold us back from the purposes and plan of God for our lives. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There is a fear of death, such a fear of death that some people never live. God said, live, live life, live life. He's got a great life for us. Go for it and live it. Jesus is freeing people right now from that fear of death. You might have noticed that your life has shrunk back, anxiety, apprehension. You know, you're closing in on you. I want to say right now, in the name of Jesus, receive your freedom today. Who the Son has set free is free indeed. He said nothing formed against you, including anxiety, including fear of the future, including fear of missing out. Nothing by any means will harm you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on him. Lean on his understanding. All your ways, acknowledge his ways, and he will direct your path. Amen? We serve a good God. He loves us so, so, so much. Well, if you're in the room today and... um, you have never trusted in Christ, you should be concerned about death, your natural death. Um, The scripture tells us in Hebrews 9.26, Jesus appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Scripture tells us that the wages of sin or the result of sin is death, spiritual death. Adam and Eve exercised their own will, did their own thing, were fear of missing out and ate that fruit from the tree, and spiritual death came on them instantly. Their eyes of their understanding, the eyes of good and evil came upon them, their understanding. And so the wages of sin is spiritual death, which will result in eternal separation from God. But the free gift of God, because he loved us so much, is eternal life for those that simply believe. Not do cartwheels, not be a a glamorous 
ballet worshiper, not anything but believe. Trust him. He is a man of his word. He's a God that is faithful. He loves each and every one of us. He's looking in our heart today and say, what fear has got a hook in your heart? Surrender it to me. Surrender your life to me, and I will give you peace. I won't make all your circumstances perfect, but I will give you peace in the midst of difficult times. I will give you hope that a better day is coming. I will put you in a family that will love you and care for you and spend their life serving you. That's what God is promising. That's what salvation. If you've never received Christ, you should be concerned because without Christ, there is eternal separation from God. We're going to give you a chance right now to receive him. If everybody would just bow your hearts and bow your eyes, we'd give a chance to people to have a private moment with the Lord. If that's your desire, when I count to three, please just put your hand up. If you want to receive Christ into your life and the, and the power of the resurrection in your life, the count of three, just put your hand up. One, two, three. Yeah, I see your hands. Yep, he loves you so much. Don't be shy. Is there anybody else? Put your hand up. Yeah, I see your hands at the back. He loves you so much. This is the best decision you've ever made. Yeah, anybody else? God loves you. God loves you so much. I see your hand. Yes, you can put them down now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can everybody just join me in prayer? Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the sacrifice Jesus made. He loved us so much that he took the shame. He took the guilt. He took everything that we deserve on himself. I put my faith in Jesus now to give me new life and to restore me to relationship with you. Father, bless me with the Holy Spirit so I can be a witness for Christ now and always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for those people that made that decision today. Powerful. Well, the last fear I want to talk about is the fear of being all out. At All Nations, we've got this, you know, pathway to discipleship. All all are welcome. We go all in to grow in our relationship with Christ. And when we begin to grow, we we all rise and serve God. And then then God calls us to go out and lead and and be leaders in in bringing people to Christ. And we call it being all out. Um, As a church, we do things. We do local outreaches and national and international outreaches so we can take the gospel to people. But as an individual, God is maybe calling us to step into more. Um, I know we're afraid sometimes to step into more because of what the personal cost is going to be to us. But I guarantee you there's a victory on the other step, on the other side of that step of faith. There's one of those things that you've been frightened about and holding you back that is there if you will step into this. I know we often don't want to take on any more because of the fear uh, of what we are asked to do um, might be too difficult. Might, we think we can't do this. We don't know. Well, I got news for you. Every step I've taken with the Lord along the way, I didn't have a clue what I was doing and I didn't uh, know too much. And that's the way I prefer to operate now, to tell you the truth. Because <laughs> I get a bunch of people around me that know what they're doing. And I get on my knees before the Lord who knows what he's doing. Sometimes we don't want to go all out because we're frightened of what he might ask and it might be too difficult. Can I tell you today, he'll be with you in those difficult steps of faith. We sometimes don't want to go all out because there's fear of being found out. Maybe something you did way in your past or or maybe um, how little you know. Often people, when we talk about, would you you mind joining the prayer team or would you run a life group? Oh, I don't know that much. I haven't been in the church that long. And it's like we have this fear of what we don't know that people might find out that we don't know anything. I have had that fear my whole life, and especially at the church, what I always do if I don't know something, I say, go see Pastor Eric. He, he knows that word. He, <laughs> I don't mean to throw him under the bus, but I, I do say, at least I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know. Or if I, if I knew it once, I forgot it now, and I got to come back and remember it again, or we study it again. We often don't do what God has called us to do because of fear of being found out or how little we know. We're fear of standing out. We don't want to be put in the spotlight. I remember I used to be asked all the time, Rick, why don't you go on the radio? Why don't you be in the radio? I mean, we had radio stations for 14 years. Why wouldn't I be involved in the radio? I said, I do not want to be on the radio for people picking out every word I've ever said. 
Like, you know, we don't want to stand out. And that's, sometimes it's humility, sometimes it's just fear of your past, to be honest. But we don't want to stand out. But I'm telling you, God is calling some people to stand out. God is calling some people. He wants to put an anointing on some people to excel in business. God wants to put an anointing on people to run life groups and see hundreds of people come to Christ because of your testimony, because of your faithfulness. God is wanting hundreds of people to rise up, take that mantle and that anointing that you know he's put on you and use it for the sake of the glory of God and for the sake of seeing Fort McMurray come to Christ. God is calling us to rise up. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. He's saying God is calling us up and out and he will not abandon us. He will not leave us alone in that place. He will be there every time. And somebody in your church family or your Christian family will be there with you. Stand up. We fear of change. I don't know about you, but I was pretty upset when that guy came to my door and I was like in the, com- I was in my comfort zone and I was in my routine and he came in the middle of it. Sometimes we don't let it um, follow the voice of God when he calls us out because we don't like the change. We have this fear of change, fear of being called out of our pattern, our comfort zone, our sweet spot. And God said, I guarantee you, if you come and step out with me, I will show you a new sweet spot, which is 10 times more comfortable than that sweet spot that you've been in. Because I have never seen, I got to testify today, I have never been in a place that I am feeling more blessed by God and more in the center of his will than I am right now. And every one of my steps have been full of fear and trepidation because I didn't think I could do it. And I don't, still don't think I can do it. Every step I take is a step into the glory of God. Every step you take of faith for God is going to step out of something into something greater for the glory of God. He's calling us to move up, to rise up and take his gospel to the people in our community. There's people at your workplace. There's people in your family you need to call. Pray with again. There's people God is saying, rise up. It's time. But we sometimes are in our routine, in our comfort zone. Been there way too long. And of course, there's the fear of being burnt out. And it's true. We've often been in organizations or workplaces or something that we get tired. They, they demand too much of us. And I'm sorry if I've done that to people. We've time caused people to do too much. But God is the strength of our heart, you know? God says, I'll be all that you need. I will give you the grace to carry on in the midst of this difficult moment. He's been there for us many, many times. He will be there for us again. John 15, 16 said, you did not choose me. He was talking to his disciples. He said, but I have chosen you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Mark 10, 29 to 30, Jesus reassures his followers that the sacrifices made for the sake of the gospel will be rewarded both in this life and in the life to come. It says this, I assure you, Jesus said, that everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. God's promise is that he will be all that we need as we step forth in confidence with him. This fear comes at us in many, many directions, but it will flee in many, many directions as we take a step of faith and hold his hand. It could be the fear of being centered out, the fear of failing. It could be the fear of missing out. Well, what if I do this and then I don't have a chance to do that? What if I miss this? It could be the fear of being called out because you're not a perfect Christian. Is there anybody else in the house or am I the only one? It could be a fear. I'm not going to do that. They're going to see that I'm not perfect. I ain't perfect. Amen. And we love you that way. Um, fear of being wiped out. Fear of being all out. I told you I'd come back to Elizabeth. Well, there we sat, holding hands, shaking a little bit, sweating a little bit. I was probably sweating a little bit more than her. Then I get a word. It's time to walk. Let's walk slowly, Elizabeth. As we walked... Those dogs, the doggone fear, (laughs) just spread around us. And we went and bought our treasures from the garage sale table. God, if you hold his hand, if you walk with him, 
slowly, circumspectly, he will take you to that place he's preordained for you to go. He will anoint you with the oil of joy for sadness, with the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He will come and lead you and direct you to a life that's full and fun, by the way, and he'll make you productive and he'll put his glory on you for his glory. Oh, let's go and serve the Lord together. Let's stand together and let me bless you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Stretch forth with your hands if you'd like. May God bless you with faith to stand when all else has failed. May you have the mind to press on towards the the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. May you have the hope to know in due season you will reap a reward if you faint not. I declare this over you now and always in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Let's praise God. Oh, we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giant.